seeing people so far signed up. Uh, there's going to be a couple more rolling in. I just wanted to say first and foremost to everybody, uh, thank you so much for supporting myself and Brandon and jumping in for the seminar. Uh, we got a lot of great information for you. Um, it's going to be geared a lot towards the first time home buyers, people that are looking to get into the market, but just have questions about the process, the amount of money they might need to uh, have in order and just how to get that money in order itself. <clears throat> so if you guys have any questions at all, uh, please, please do not turn on the, uh, the mic. It'll, uh, it'll throw me off completely and I'll kick you right out of the meeting. Completely kidding. But just put it in the chat box for me so I can um, answer all of the questions afterwards at the end of the meeting. Um, Brandon and I are going to try to make it 30 minutes to 40 minutes here. Uh, nice and quick, precise, get you guys all of the information and let you carry on with your night. And then whoever wants to stick around, pick our brains, ask some questions, uh, we're certainly going to help you out there. So uh, prizes awarded at the end, if you've seen any of the ads, is going to be a $20 gift card to skip the dishes to the person with the best question. And then uh, we're also going to give out a $50 gift card to Amazon to a random winner. That's the, uh, the wheel you saw at the start. Uh, pretty fancy, I found it online today. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's get it going. Before, uh, before we get into the meat and potatoes, Brandon and I just wanted to introduce ourselves. The, uh, the handsome looking guy in the top left is me. Uh, I've been working as a real estate advisor or real estate agent, whatever you want to call it, for the last two years now with Stonehouse Realty and the Adam Lloyd Home Selling Team. Since then, I've uh, made the Medallion Club top 10% of realtors in the Lower Mainland. I used to work as a architectural technologist for uh, JKA, JKA Architects in Burnaby for Jordan Kutev. Um, I'm still working with him off and on uh, with a couple projects. We're working on one in Port Coquitlam along Salisbury Avenue, a uh, six townhouse unit. So keep your eyes open for that. Uh, I've had a little bit of background in house inspection, have my education in that, and then a little bit of work experience as a carpenter in the British properties building some estates up there. So uh, a little bit uh, well-rounded there. I, uh, I have a little bit of background in house inspection and carpentry, which I love to, uh, which I think helps me out in uh, assisting my clients. Oops, how did I go backwards? <laughs> Brandon, I'll let you go and introduce yourself. You betcha. Well, it's great to meet everybody. Every architect uh, needs a good plan and Liam is a great face. I'm the plan, uh, planner behind the, the plan here. Uh, I myself am a financial advisor, have been for the past three years and take pride in working with clients, being able to uh, help them with their financial plans. And with this here was actually uh, the number one volume and rated uh, advisor here with the company I'm with, which is Primary Financial Services here in Surrey, BC. Uh, I myself have been able to really be able to build a passion for better well-being of clients uh, as I was a Bachelor of Nursing student and uh, have been able to translate that uh, from wanting to better the well-being of people physically to wanting to better the well-being of people financially. So excited to be able to connect with everyone on the webinar here today. Thank you, Brandon. Perfect. Like I said, it's uh, we're going to start out just with a quick the quick process for all first-time home buyers. Uh, to make it as uh, simple and as plain as possible, lay it out all, all out on the table. And then we'll get into a little bit more of the uh, investment strategies and financial strategies that Brandon will help out with. So right off the bat, just wanted to go through the, bri the buying process, how it all works for, uh, for anyone looking to get into the real estate market. First and foremost, I wanted to point out uh, the tape and pins that I've included. Uh, it was absolutely genius on my part. I'm extremely proud of that. But uh, number one is engage the professionals, a uh, realtor, a mortgage broker, financial advisor, everything like that. Uh, we're not just saying this because we're having the seminar. Um, completely open, work with whoever you want, but it's number one and it's going to be the most important. Um, to answer any of these questions, to talk to them about this buying process, to, to pick their brain about the different questions that you have. I mean, at the end of the day, you've tuned into the seminar because you do have questions and you might be interested in the, uh, in the process uh, to, to get into the real estate market. Next, get the pre-approval mortgage amount. Uh, start talking to your financial advisor, uh, your bank, whoever it may be, whoever you feel comfortable with. The last thing that we want to see in this industry is someone... Uh, you know, looking around for different places. If you look at number three, researching on their own, finding what they like and dislike. Uh, the last thing we want to see is someone uh, looking around shopping and then realizing afterwards that they can't afford what, uh, what they've been looking for. 
even if you're three months, six months out, a year out, two years out, uh, get in contact with a mortgage broker or financial expert. Uh, they'll give you the best plan to save that money and ensure you get the nice house you're looking for. Number three, simply do the research on your own. Start looking online. There's a thousand websites. I have three of my own. Um, start looking at properties, figure out what you want, what you don't want. Um, once you figure that out, start talking to your realtor, go around and start viewing some beautiful homes. Sorry about that. <clears throat> now, next I wanted to go into, oh, I'm still committing people, people still rolling in. I appreciate it. Um, next I wanted to go into the accepted offer. Once you do find that place, you find the, uh, the home you love, it's putting in the accepted offer and having that subject removal date or the subject time. People ask me, a lot of my friends and family, you know, what are subjects? What is that subject time? Subjects are simply financing, inspection. You'll see uh, the arrow pointing up to the top left or top of the screen there. Financing, inspection, reviewing strata documents, everything like that. So once you do get that accepted offer, the contract and the deal isn't technically considered firm until you remove those subjects that are stipulated in your contract. Um, next, we move on to the, uh, you know, once you have got that accepted offer and the deal is firm, you'll have a uh, completion and closing date set in that contract. And I just wanted to go over quickly, if you look at the bottom of the screen, the difference between completion, adjustments, and possession. Um, a lot of people think they're all the same thing. And while they are similar and usually a couple days apart, they are slightly different. And it's important to know the difference, you know, when you are talking about the lingo in the buying process. Completion, quite simply, is you know when you are going into the lawyer's office, signing everything, but transferring the title into your name, and you know it's in the title of, or it's in the name, it's completion. They're completing on the sale. Next, you move to adjustments and possession. They're typically on the same day. Sometimes you space them a day or two out. Um, adjustments is just the official day that uh, they're going to start charging your mortgage. Um, it's the official day when you're going to start taking over taxes. Um, we're going to go over in the next couple of slides how the taxes are split up between uh, the buyer and seller there. And then possession, you'll never guess, but it's uh, the day you get possession of your new beautiful home. Move on to the next slide here for you. Making a plan um, on top of uh, the buying process and understanding all of that is just making a plan and knowing what you want to do in the market before you, before you make that purchase. Just understand what you need to look for. So the big three questions that I always recommend to my clients is asking yourself, how long do you plan to own this home? Will you be living and renting, living or renting in it? And what kind of investment strategy are you going to have before purchasing this home? <laughs> A little later on, we're going to go through different investment strategies and uh, we'll come right back to this slide. Next, one of the biggest things people ask me when they're first time home buyers looking to get into the market, Liam, how much money is this going to cost? A lot of the times people will make the mistake of just looking directly at the purchase price, going to an online mortgage calculator. It gives you a down payment that you might need to pay. And, you know, they wipe their hands and say they're done, walk away from it, and then they're blindsided. So just wanted to quickly put this out and have it all set up for you guys. Once again, if you have any questions about the, you know, the money you might have to pay on a property you're looking at, feel free to reach out to myself. If not, reach out to uh, your mortgage broker, realtor, whoever you have there to answer these questions. Down payment and deposit, uh, they're very similar. The down payment is what you're going to be putting towards your mortgage, while the deposit is what you're putting to secure the, pro the property at hand. So sometimes, or what I've been asked before is, do I have to pay a down payment and the deposit? Technically, yes, but the deposit forms part of the down payment. So if you look down at the bottom here, if you're paying 10% for your down payment, that's what you've decided with your mortgage broker. You know, they've said if you pay 10%, you'll be paying these mortgage amounts per month. And you've decided on 10%. And then the deposit for that home is 5%. You'll be paying that deposit first upon subject removal. And then when completion comes and it's time to register that mortgage, you'll pay the remainder of that 5%. And in the next slide, we're going to be going over just the breakdown of cost for different uh, properties. Next, we go to inspection, quite straightforward. That's someone coming in and checking the property. It's, it ranges heavily depending on the inspector you wanna use there. Uh, the size of the home, obviously, if you're looking at a 3,500 square foot you know, mansion, not mansion, I guess, but large home in Maple Ridge or Langley, it's gonna be a little bit more expensive than a uh, 500 square foot apartment. 
Next move to everybody's favorite thing to pay, and that is taxes. Um, quite simply, you're going to be paying one taxes, one tax either way, uh, whether it's a new build or an existing build. For a new build, you'll be paying that GST of 5%, whereas for a older building or you know a lived-in building, you'll be paying the property transfer tax of 1% on the first 200,000, 2% on the remainder. Once again, we're going to be going through all the breakdown of uh, of how to calculate all of this for different listings in the next couple slides. Uh, legal fees, that's just paying the lawyer when we were talking about before when it comes down to completion date, they'll charge you anywhere from 500 to $1,200. To tell you the truth, if you're paying over $800 for your lawyer fees, you might wanna find someone else. It's uh, You can be paying quite easily six to $700 depending on who you use. And disbursements, um, that can vary, varies heavily as well. Uh, it's it's gonna be completely dependent on where you're buying, the building you're buying, um, the time of year that you're buying, that comes right back to the adjustment dates for uh, taxes. So let's say you bought an apartment that has $2,000 worth of taxes per year. Um, your adjustment date is right smack dab in the middle of the year, July 1st you would pay half of that, half of the taxes for the year, so $1,000. That's why the disbursements will always change. It's also things like registering your mortgage, um, registering yourself with the Strata Corporation, once again, always changes, but shouldn't be much more than $2,000 to $2,000 roughly. So a uh, quick breakdown of the money here, if you're looking at a resale property. Oh, did somebody write on the page? Sorry about that. I don't know why there's a red mark right through the page there. Anyways. Um, I meant to get written on. It's all good, my friend. You see it? Yep. <laughs> Did I do that? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the resale, it's, so if you're looking at this property right in the top right-hand corner, it has $350,000. So we're looking at number one and two, which was the down payment and deposit just for, uh, just for reference sake here, let's say you've decided with your mortgage broker to pay a 10% down payment. That'd be $34,990 you need up front. Uh, it's roughly $600 for that inspection. Once again, that can change. Since this is an existing property, you won't be paying any GST, but they will catch you on the property transfer tax for roughly $5,000. Legal fees, 800. Once again, can change in disbursements. Uh, same goes for that as well. For the pre-sale, it's um, gonna be roughly the same thing there in regards to the uh, basically everything besides the tax. So let's say you're paying a 10% down payment and deposit. For this specific pre-sale era, the one that I'm marketing myself with my team is a 10% deposit. Um, so let's say $35,000 upfront for that, $600 for the inspection, and then GST will be paying roughly $17,000. So that can sometimes be a deterrent for people with the uh, GST. One thing to keep in mind with uh, any new build, if you are a first time home buyer, is that you could be eligible for a, uh, a reimbursement of your GST or your PTT, property transfer tax. Uh, that's dependent on your level of income, uh, the property that you're purchasing. Um, there's a couple different factors that the mortgage broker or the, I guess the government more specifically, CMHC will be looking at to reimburse you that amount. Um, going down to legal fees, disbursements, uh, they'll always change. So I think it is time for Brandon to take over and go a little bit more in depth about being financially educated and uh, everything to do with that. And I'm going to try to take that line away from the page because it will drive me crazy. Go ahead, Brandon. Sounds good. So yes, we want to be financially educated coming into a lovely purchase, like being able to afford a home. So we're gonna flip, we're gonna flip over to the next slide here. And we wanna talk about, do we have a plan of action or do we have an account that is hopefully gonna be able to allow us to introduce to the brokerage. So brokerage I own is Chimerica, we're a full service financial services company, an insurance brokerage. And it's all about what do we do for you? Because what we do is we educate and capitalize on the multitude of registered accounts and grants that are available to you, especially for that home buyers program that can accelerate you and help you reach those goals faster. We provide convenient support and professional financial reviews as life changes happen. As we see when it comes to being a first time homeowner, there's gonna be changes all along the way. 
Also, protecting a large, largest asset with the right insurance plan, be able to make sure that once you do buy that home, that it's protected in the structure. It's also protected in the payment. Now flip over to the next page here. So we look at this of knowledge is key and looking at the registered plans. So this is, we're going to talk a little bit about the first time home buyers plan. So on the left is going to be a person who's just saving either under their mattress, which <laughs> we have seen, into their checking account or into something like a tax-free savings account. But on the right, when we look at being able to buy your first home, anything that classifies as a retirement asset, like an RRSP, a portion of, a, of your pension plan, is actually being able to be withdrawn, tax deferred, so you wouldn't have to be taxed on that money, while well, you're being able to purchase your home up to $35,000 when it comes to that first time home buyers. So we look at that as an example. Being able to purchase a $50,000 or $500,000 home, you would need to come up with at minimum $25,000 and then all those other expenses that Liam had spoken about. Well, imagine you've got a work pension or a, or a group RRSP that you have access to. Just by doing the analysis, just by finding out if it's available, you could actually have your down payment sitting in your account already. I'm gonna flip over to the next page. So we're gonna leave you with an acronym because the thing is, is we're gonna, we're gonna fire a lot of information at you and being able to really give you the nuts and bolts of what we want you to take away. So this is the acronym I like my clients to know and it's called getting you paid. So looking at the P, that's gonna be the protection. So for me, I was a single dude when I bought my first home. But some of the people on this call here, gonna be married, gonna have kids, you might already have some kind of insurance. And what we look at is when you are trying to buy a home, ultimately you wanna be able to save money so that you can afford that down payment and that change in lifestyle. So on the front end, we look at reducing your insurance costs. Now that can be life insurance like depicted in the uh, page here. That can also be home insurance. That can be your business insurance. That can be auto insurance, but ultimately an insurance review looking at your protection. Then we look at asset accumulation, which is gonna be that down payment where you're gonna be able to actually fully fund that check when the realtor finds that perfect home and the mortgage broker is able to provide your assets or your mortgage, you can come up with that piece and actually get keys. Then the I is gonna be the income. So we see a budget worksheet. We wanna know before we purchase this home and after we purchase this home, what's coming in, what's going out, because it's great to want to own a mansion, but the income has to suffice that mansion because there's nothing worse than purchasing a home and being stressed about your financial lifestyle once you own that home. And then we look at the debt. The debt resolution is going to be uh, one of the strangleholds that the mortgage broker who's trying to get you funded isn't able to get around. And one of the things that I do with the debt is being able to help you restructure it to a point that you are able to qualify for a mortgage. So we'll flip over to the next page here. Oh, sorry about that. All good, my friend. And we're gonna to toss it back to Liam as he's the expert on our real estate market and be able to talk about what's happening today. Thank you guys. Absolutely, perfect. Well, thank you, Brandon there for, the, uh, for helping us out. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to go quickly into the real estate market for us. Um, to tell you the truth, we're going to be going just scraping the surface, looking at the pre-sale versus resale. If you're looking at our market, uh, one of the biggest things to keep in mind is um, the amount of money that you're going to be purchasing for these properties in the age of the building. So if you're looking at that pre-sale, typically it's going to have the higher purchase price, whereas you look at a resale, it's going to have a little bit lower of a purchase price. Why does that happen? Well, the newer and the better a building is or the better shape a building is in the more expensive it's going to be um, if the building is old ha has poor maintenance and is breaking down at the seams then it's going to be a little bit cheaper to purchase now what's important to keep in mind is that maintenance fee and the condition of the building especially if you're a first-time home buyers what a lot of people see is you know a cheap purchase price they think i can get into this house quite easily i'll pay 35 to forty thousand dollars to get in there and i'm off scot-free i'll put it out to a renter and i'm ready to go but the problem can happen there is the higher maintenance fee and strata fee. So if you're looking at an old building, roughly 30 years old, you're going to get that lower purchase price, but you might, have a, you might have a much higher maintenance fee or strata fee. 
and you look at a pre-sale, you have the higher purchase price, but a lower maintenance fee and strata fee. So let's say you buy a resale for $350,000. It's uh, a mortgage payment of $1,700 a month, and then you're paying a maintenance fee of $500 a month. Well, in grand total, the money leaving your bank is going to be $2,200. Now, on the flip side of this, let's say you get a pre-sale, something brand new or maybe a couple years old that has the lower maintenance fee. It's a little bit cheaper to maintain. Let's say your mortgage rate is $1,900 a month and that maintenance fee is only $150 a month. Well, grand total for that resale, you're paying roughly $2,200 and for the pre-sale, you'll be paying you know, roughly $2,150. Completely dependent there. Um, just something to look out for is the maintenance fee and strata fee, especially if you're considering new or old. In any kind of brand new building, you'll get what's called the brand new or the new builder's warranty, a 10, five, and two. Uh, the 10 is referring to the structure of the building, the actual foundation of it, everything like that. You'll have a 10 year warranty on that. Five is for the systems, I believe, and two is for any interior problems that you might find. They'll replace, replace it within two years. And uh, most importantly for pre-sales, if you're looking into that route, make sure you're asking your realtor to inquire about deposit structure, completion timeline and buying incentives along with much more. Uh, buying incentives is a funny one just because, you know, developers are just like everyone else. They want to get the deal done. They want to finish it. And uh, if you twist their arm a little bit, sometimes you can find a little bit more and get a little bit more out of them there. So, like I said before, we're going to come back to the investment strategies and uh, even referring to that slide I was talking about is making a plan. So deciding how long you want to live in one of these in your next purchase is you know, not a simple question, but it's achievable to answer. Number two, are you going to be living and renting? That one's not too hard to answer. And then number three is ensuring that you know you are ensuring the investment strategy that you're going to be going with moving forward. There are many different strategies to have. Um, and it's important to know how long you do plan on living in these places or if you're going to be living and renting to do that. So we'll start off just with uh, the, the oldest one in the book. That's flipping houses as an investment strategy. Um, if you're doing that, you're just going to want to, you know, I could go through the bullet point form here and tell you guys what to do. But it's quite straightforward. You buy a property at the lowest price possible that needs a little tender love and care. You fix it up and you sell it at a higher price. The one thing I do want to bring up here is, you know, something that I've found with clients is, you know, they have this idea, grand idea, they're going to buy this house, put a bunch of beautiful renovations and sell it at twice the price. That isn't always the case, um, especially if you're going to be getting into flipping, what you're going to want to make sure you're doing is making a detailed list of your budget and talking to your local realtor about what kind of renovations you can do to actually bring value to that house. Um, the last, the, the funny one we see all the time is people buying a house, painting the walls, um, putting in some new furniture and, and thinking that they've done a full renovation. That's not the case. Uh, make sure you're putting value into the house for the amount of money that you're putting into that house. Quite simple there. Uh, the next one is very simple as well. Rental properties, um, you know, buy a property, rent it out, make sure that rent is covering your mortgage. Um, you know, we don't want to make it that simple, but it is essentially that simple. The one thing I did want to point out for you guys, if you are looking at this as a strategy, is knowing the difference between a short-term rental and a long-term. Um, a short-term rental is uh, things like Airbnb, something like a six-month lease. Um, when we see these short-term rentals, you'll see a much higher rental income in amount from your renters, but a much higher vacancy rate along with that. Whereas the long-term lease, you'll see um, a little bit lower of rental income, but a much lower vacancy rate as well. The reason you want to keep that vacancy rate, uh, or you want to keep the vacancy rate in mind at least, is that um, you know when you don't have a renter in there, if you are going with the short-term rentals, there's there's a possibility that you won't have ever, anyone in your unit, your apartment, your house for you know a couple of weeks, maybe even months on end. Oh, don't know how I did that. And if that does happen you know, you have to make sure you're covering that mortgage and you have the money in your bank account to be able to uh, pay the bank and make sure they're not going to foreclose on you there. So that's something to keep in mind if you are going with the strategy of trying to get as many properties as possible. Next, we're moving into the live-in flip slash rent. Uh, these are one of my favorites. It kind of uh, mixes in both of the uh, strategies from before. It's something that I'm most interested in for myself. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, the current apartment that I'm, that I'm working on and living in uh, quite soon is that, uh, 
you, you get the property at a good price, like always, you wanna make sure you're getting the best price possible, and then you begin renovating it. You do it at your own pace, and you can sell it at any point possible for you there. Um, the reason I like this one is it's the lowest risk for uh, especially first time home buyers here. Um, it gives you the reason it does give the lower risk is because you know you're going to have a house expense per month anyways. Um, if you do have that vacancy rate or you can't sell it for whatever reason, your timeline will be flexible because your monthly uh, budget for yourself for your own living will be satisfying that mortgage. You're not worrying about the uh, just landlord strategy of uh, ensuring that you have someone in that unit to pay the rent, pay the mortgage for you. So this one's very straightforward as well. It's just a different strategy you can keep in mind if you are looking to get into the market. Finally, my bread and butter, my favorite one, the holding properties. Uh, this is something um, you basically purchase in an area or a specific market that you think is going to increase in value or that you know is going to increase in value over a certain time span. And that's why it's so important to know the time span of what you're thinking for this next investment. So something like a long-term hold will be 10 to 20 years, sometimes more depending on what kind of hold you're looking at. Um, an example of this in our area, I heard the other day, um, what is it, Sasquatch Mountain just around Chilliwack, they're thinking about um, the, same com com the same company that purchased Whistler and made Whistler what it is today. They're hoping to do the same sort of thing for Sasquatch Mountain in that area around Chilliwack. So something like that would be investing in that area for 10 to 20 years. You rent it out in the meantime, you hold that property, you hold it until you can sell it at a much higher price years down the road. Whereas you look at the short term hold, uh, you know, a much lower risk, lower reward plan, plan oh, I'm stumbling over the words, lower, lower risk plan here is something two to five years. And one of the examples that I see with my clients is uh, like a place like Langley. Uh, we've already heard in the news that they've confirmed the SkyTrain plan to go from Surrey into Langley. That's an area where you can invest a, you know, buy a house without the, uh, the price tag of being near a SkyTrain quite yet. Whereas in two to five years when it's built and it's ready to go, there's going to be a lot more renters and families looking to get into that area. So if you are looking to get into the holding properties, an important thing to look out for is going to be the local zoning bylaws, official community plans. And like I was saying for the short term hold transit routes, those are the biggest things for renters and, and younger people, especially the way we're moving in, uh, this day and age is getting away from personal transportation and getting more towards public transportation. Um, local zoning bylaws, to tell you the truth, they're quite boring. Um, that's why I transferred over from architecture to real estate here. You got to communicate with more people, get talking in front of a camera. Um, but yeah, you're going to want to go through the zoning bylaws. You're going to want to know exactly, especially if you're buying a house, to know exactly what you can build on that property. Um, just before we get to the, uh, the next slide here, one example for the zoning bylaws is in Port Coquitlam. I have a couple clients looking there and just a couple years ago, they changed the, local, the uh, zoning bylaws there to allow coach houses in the backyard. Well, that changed the, uh, the value of homes there. If anything was over 8,000 square foot and you had a, um, a laneway access in the backyard, all of a sudden your house that was worth 850,000 is now worth 950 because there's the potential of putting a coach house in the backyard. So those are the things you're gonna to wanna to look for, at least get your uh, realtor to look out for, the zoning bylaws, the official community plans for different cities, and just knowing what exactly is going to get built and what's going to get invested in that area in the future, near future or uh, far down the road there. So we're coming near the end here um, with my, like I was saying before, for that pre-sale, my company and I, or my team and I rather, are uh, marketing a project called New Era in uh, Maple Ridge. So we're just going to go over quick facts and uh, different information about the project there. Um, the reason I love this one the most is because, you know, not even, not just myself, but another guy on my team, I don't know if he's in the meeting at Camille, we're, we're both thinking about investing in this property or this development ourselves. If not in phase one, then for sure in phase two. Um, Maple Ridge is an ever evolving area. And this, uh, this project will be seven phases built over roughly 10 to 15 years. 
800 residential units to be put in the three city block span. Now what that tells you is, uh, sorry, and the Maple Ridge also confirmed that they're gonna allow the concrete high rises to come in in this, uh, this project. The first concrete high rises in Maple Ridge and they'll be the tallest in Maple Ridge, of course. Now what this tells us is that uh, the city has already okayed um, this huge development. Uh, they're, they're open to change. They want this area to change. And let's call a spade a spade. If you're looking anywhere else for a pre-sale one bedroom unit, you're certainly not gonna be able to get it at the price range of 350,000, really anywhere. I was just working on an assignment in Burnaby and I think it sold for 630,000. So almost twice the price there, you're gonna be able to invest in a, uh, a neighborhood that's continuously changing. Um, with this space, I mean, I could go on for day or for hours at least. New amenity spaces, swimming pools, gyms, parks. Um, not only this development, there's a couple other pre-sales you can look at in the area as well. Sierra Ridge, Rosslyn Ridge. Um, there's so many developers and companies putting money into Maple Ridge currently. Um, we've also said at the office, I'll go to the next slide, there's some more pictures there. Perfect. Um, we've been saying at the, at the office and talking with different realtors, uh, Maple Ridge is kind of what Port Coquitlam and Coquitlam used to be a couple of years ago. Um, a cheap, inexpensive place for young families to move out to and start their lives in beautiful homes. But, you know, as we've seen the years pass, as most of you know, at least if you've looked at the market at all, Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam are, are extremely expensive now. Uh, they've climbed in price rapidly over the last 15 years. I mean, if you're comparing it to Vancouver, it's a little bit cheaper, of course, but uh, I think everything, just about everything's cheaper than Vancouver. Um, with this development as well, we're selling phase one, 135 units, I believe, we're in charge of uh, to sell. We've been marketing it for about three weeks now, and about 55, I think, 54 have been sold. Um, it has the lowest deposit structure you can find. It's very rare to find anything under 10%. This is going to have a 10% deposit for this one. Completion 2022. Um, a beautiful, beautiful development that myself and uh, my colleagues that are, that are working on it heavily believe in and want to invest in ourselves and will. So uh, what, how do we do for time there? Yeah, we're, we're running 30 minutes here right now, right on schedule. Woo! That's not bad at all. We got, a, we got a bunch of amazing questions here coming up, so this is going to be I saw that. It was uh, kept popping up on my screen. I couldn't quite. Uh, I, was, I was losing my groove. No, oh, I was. Gonna, I love it though. Um, shoot, I went back a, or forward a page rather. Oh my! <laughs> oh my gosh! It's all falling apart right at the end for me. Um, once again, guys, thank you so much to everybody for tuning in, um, giving your support. Like I said a couple times throughout this, we're really just scratching the surface with this presentation. To go into depth about the buying process, the different amount of money um, you'll need for this purchase, everything like that, to give you the full details about ERA, everything else, we need at least two to three hours to really go through all of that. But we just wanted to get it out on the table and just try to put it as clear as possible for everybody. If you do have any more questions, if you want to pick our brain, both of our phone numbers are right there at the, uh, in the middle of the page. Um, if you want to reach out and ask some more questions, if not, reach out to, uh, to somebody else and start getting these questions answered. Exactly. So we're going to, we're going to rapid fire these questions here, Liam, because we did have, uh, we, we're, we're right on time. This is awesome. So we've got about five or six questions to be able to, to be able to. But one of the questions that they had, or we had, uh, we had Karen, and she asked, if we wanted to buy and rent it out, would you be able to uh, help find a potential renter or connect you with somebody that would be able to help you find somebody? You know, like, or is, there, is there something like that? Is there like a property manager or something like that you have access yeah. to? So how our, our, my team and my brokerage works is that um, I work with Stonehouse Realty. Um, many of you may have heard of Stonehouse. Some of you uh, maybe haven't. It's a smaller brokerage, uh, just just around 100 agents and all of us are very connected. We, we speak uh, to one another daily. We have two offices, so we're all talking hand in hand. The reason I bring that up is because anytime we do need a property manager, anytime we need a carpenter to come in, 
anytime you need something extremely specific, like working on a fireplace from 1965 with a brick mortar, this, this, and that, we can put it into that group chat and we always have somebody to help us out and uh, recommend different people when it comes down to buying it and getting a property manager to help you rent it out. Um, yeah, we have, we certainly have a couple people that we could hook you up with. Um, the CEO and one of my team members are the, the team lead. Adam Lloyd is a property manager himself. That's typically who I refer most of my clients to. Absolutely amazing. Not just a pretty face then. <laughs> so next question is going to be from Mark Campbell here. And he had asked, uh, specifically like what happened in Port Coquitlam once the, uh, once the SkyTrain came in, he said, if you were looking near Langley, what do you estimate the property value change percent when the SkyTrain is built? Like if you were to have a $500,000 house, what could you see that going to with the added value of not needing a car versus being able to use a SkyTrain? Uh, well, that's one of the things, uh, the golden question. Actually, actually, once we're finished this question, we'll just do the quick raffle for the Amazon there. But I like this one. The one thing that uh, we always try to avoid with uh, when we're giving these estimations is, and the biggest thing to look out for is that it's going to be dependent on how the market's moving for that amount of time. So to give a specific percentage of how much it will increase is very hard to say. Um, especially with this, uh, with our times, we, you know, we could find out within, uh, within a month, within a week here that they're, they're disallowing public transit. Obviously it doesn't look like that, but we just don't know how the market's going to be moving. What we do know is the things like transit, things like, um, let's say bodies of water, mountain views, things like that. It increases the value for properties and we know that it will increase a certain percentage. Um, but it's going to be dependent on how the market moves within that time as well. We could see within five years, the market double. We could see it tank in half. Exactly. So very, very good to keep in mind that uh, you want to, you want to have a strategy for your home and not just purchasing based on what you hear or what you see. So amazing value there, Liam. Perfect. Um, yeah, let me just, I got a couple of people that entered late. Uh, Gosh, I'm skipping through all my slides. Sorry about this, you guys. Just exiting the uh, exit. That's the button. We're going to go over really quickly, just in case uh, we've answered all the questions for everyone else, to the wheel of names generator. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen people in the participant. Da, da, da. I just want to make sure I have everyone. I'm going to quickly turn off screen sharing and turn it right back on just so I can do this really quickly. Uh, if you guys still have questions, keep putting them into the, uh, the chat box there. I'll be answering all of them. Um, and then in the meantime, Brandon, if you just want to look through and pick a winner for the uh, gift card. Not that Brandon's picking it. We're both picking it. I think I have just about all of the names there. Put down, oh no, Jared, Jared Dulaba. That's what I was missing. Perfect. I'll go right back to screen sharing for you guys. Take, take my face off the screen for you. So once again, thanks for everybody to come out. Uh, as soon as I click tap to spend, it's going to decide who gets the $50 Amazon gift card. Uh, best of luck to everybody, and thanks again for coming. Oh, Spencer. Even has the sound to it as well. <laughs> Perfect. Once again, thanks to everybody for uh, coming out and uh, listening to the presentation here. We're going to go through all of the questions that you guys asked and uh, help you out there. Other than that, if you have to go and continue on with your night, then uh, and have a good one. Stay safe out there. There we go. So next question that we look at is going to be from Tristan. 
Hey, All right. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Brandon, I hate to interrupt you there. Do okay. we have a winner so far for the skip the dishes yet? Just so we can announce it before, uh, if anyone needs to leave. Yeah, you gotcha. So just looking at all the questions here. I, uh, when we're looking here, just going through. So I like this one because it's got a really intricate uh, question w within it. It says, as a first time home buyer wanting to buy a somewhat fixed upper, what problems need to be listed during the buying process? And that was the that was the best question, and that was from Kelsa Lefebvre. Hopefully, I, I hopefully I said I said that right there. So <laughs> Kelsa Lefebvre is delivered to your door, and love um, to have, love to have an answer for that question there once we're once we're all taken care of. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah. So what was that? Uh, if you're looking for a fixer upper, what problems need to be listed during the buying process? What problems? Um, I'm assuming you mean what problems need to be listed uh, by the realtor themselves? What needs to be disclosed? Um, really anything that you ask the realtor outright should be disclosed. Uh, what we call is latent and patent defects. Patent defect is anything that you can, um, see in person, or I guess see in, um, see without ripping anything away. You can see through a walkthrough is a patent defect. Whereas a latent defect is going to be something that's hidden a little way from, uh, from everybody that you can't see. It's something like asbestos in the wall. It's something like, uh, let's see, the foundation cracking that you'd never be able to, the house is shifting, something like that. That would be something you would have to uh, disclose. But if the, uh, sometimes what we see in the market is that, you know, sometimes owners play dumb and they don't know or they, they haven't heard about any kind of problems they have and uh, they won't list those things. So what you're going to want to be sure of is that you have a realtor that will be able to uh, look into that for you and then um, have an inspector that can also clarify any kind of questions you might have and bring forward any kind of problems that the house or apartment might have. Beautiful, great answer. Then we look here from Tristan. He's asking, is it smart to not just buy in a big city, but to buy in a small town? And uh, when, you, when you're saying buying, uh, Tristan, if you're, if you're on here, are you talking about buying, uh, I assume you're talking about buying as an investment, is that correct? Did I mute everybody? Is that going to be my fault here? I'm going to stop sharing. So it's a great question. Probably, probably other people have that question about uh, yeah. looking at investment properties. When you're looking at a small town, is it a smart buy? What determines a smart buy then? Well, it's going to be everything that I was considered or brought up in the presentation there. So if you are looking in a small town, it's um, what kind of development and what kind of future you see for that town itself. Um, if you can tell that you are, that the city itself is proactive, they're putting more money into the city, they have new businesses coming into the city, then yeah, it's certainly going to be somewhere you want to invest. If it's a town that's, you know, falling apart at the seams, people are constantly moving away, then it's something you might want to avoid. Versus a city, a lot of the times if you're looking into a city, the property value is already within the city and it's a much it's a much larger sphere of what you need to be looking for. And it's more geared towards economic uh, pressures that are going to change the price of, uh, of the, whatever you're buying in a city. Amazing. And then we have a question about the pool side. I think, I th I think Mark's looking at becoming a, a owner that w and being able to sit poolside here with a question. So he asked, when you look to an, an amenities, are you looking at higher strata fees to maintain those services? Great question. Absolutely. So, you know, the biggest thing that uh, if you're looking into a big, uh, a big strata is that if you have a pool, it's going to raise your strata fees greatly. Strata fees are going to be covering anything that goes wrong in that building. So if you have a massive gym in your building, it's beautiful, state of the art equipment. If anything breaks or needs to be replaced, anything like that, that's coming out of the strata's pocket. It's coming out of the contingency fund and it can affect you as an owner as it, uh, it could result in a special levy or an assessment or just higher maintenance fees in general. A pool is the big, uh, the big no, no, just in the sense of higher maintenance fee. Although you can get away with it um, just in regards to the new era development, it's seven phases and all seven phases will share the cost of that pool. So around 800 units will be sharing the cost of that. Um, we see it a lot in Burnaby Brentwood area as well. Usually three, four towers, concrete towers will share the amenity space, one big, large amenity space and uh, share the cost together. 
Beautiful. Then we have we have a three part question from our already uh, uh, from our winner for the Amazon from Spencer here, and uh, he had asked. It's a three part question. So the first here I'll be able to answer. And he asked, uh, would you recommend getting a mortgage from your bank or from your family's investment banker? And ultimately, that answer is whoever gets the deal done and keeps your best interests at heart. So that's going to be that answer. There's, there, there's no uh, major benefit between bank or broker. The only thing is, is that you're going to want to shop so that you're able to see what, what the best rate is, but also considering the different parts of your investment strategy. There's, there's lots of things that factor a mortgage that you're going to be looking at, like if you're going to be there for the full term. So you're going to want to, you're going to, want to factor those in as well. Uh, the second portion I'll throw at you here, uh, Liam, is do taxes get paid from your mortgage or do you have to come up with those out of pocket as a, as a portion of your down payment? Ooh, I like that one. Uh, so taxes, uh, for the most part, is something, yeah, there's a possibility you could roll it in within your mortgage. Um, I highly doubt that, especially for the first adjustment date. Um, like I was saying before, between completion, adjustment, and possession. Adjustment is the official day that they'll transfer the taxes around. So if you are making that initial purchase, they're going to need the taxes to be paid right away. So that's part of the upfront costs. Um, if you're buying into any kind of apartment condo, the taxes should be much more than $1,500 uh, to $3,000 for the entire year. But if you're buying only a portion of the year, it'll be a lot less. Exactly. Beautiful. And then with, the, with this here, last question with, with the home is if there's an opportunity, oh, and a window of opportunity now is that window. But he's, uh, the question Spencer asked uh, last is, are there any places allowing selling pre-build so being able to purchase because you have the money and then selling once you're further into the phase here. Oh, the assignment. Uh, yeah, so this used to have a, a big, it used to be all over the news called shadow flipping in Vancouver. Uh, what people would do is just with our real estate market, uh, sorry, short, short, uh, short answer is yes, you can assign contracts. But uh, sorry, the reason it got such a big name is because it was called shadow flipping. What people would do is they purchase a kind of pre-sale around, let's say, 400,000, completely random numbers here. Let's say they purchased the pre-sale around 400,000. And because the Vancouver real estate market was skyrocketing so quickly that within the year or two years that it took to actually build that pre-sale and have it done, in that time, the value of that home would increase so greatly that they could sell it before it was even built, before they even made a mortgage payment and make some kind of profit out of it. So you know, with that, all they would pay is the deposit which way they would get reimbursed for when they assigned the contract. And then they would uh, make a profit on top of that without making one mortgage payment. Um, as for right now with assignments, what we see is developers have smartened up a little bit and what they'll do is they'll put an assignment fee in any kind of pre-sale contract. I just worked on one in Brentwood. It was 2% assignment fee plus a plus thousand dollars on top of that. So, you know, roughly $600,000 apartment with a 2% assignment fee. Um, any kind of profit you're making, it'll mostly be sent back to the, uh, to the developer in that 2%. So long story short, you can do the assignment. You can assign a contract to a pre-sale still. Um, it's just, it's not as income producing as some people think it is. Beautiful. And the next question is actually a statement, and we love that people are, are, are acting right away. Uh, we have Rosanna looking at uh, just saying thank you and looking forward to building a plan. Love that that is a uh, forward thinker. And the last question is from our winner, uh, Kelsa, and she had asked, as a first-time home buyer wanting to buy a, a fixer-upper, what problems need to be listed during that buying process? So you touched on this, you, you touched on this here uh, during the presentation. But if you can just go over maybe the top three to look for when you're looking at uh, looking at a fixer upper. Okay, so let's just how long do us as buyers have to turn around and get compensated for those issues that were listed, if any at all? Just the question Pardon. right above that, there, my friend. Pardon me. Just the question right above that. Oh, okay. As was uh, wanting to buy somewhat fixer upper problems. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I thought I answered that there. That uh, latent defect versus patent defect. How long do they get compensated for those issues and what are the top three things you should look out for? Well, top three things you should look out for certainly is just going to be the biggest systems with the house. Um, by systems, I mean um, the roof, the roofing system, the exterior cladding system, 
Um, the insulation, it's not usually a big fix, but that's a system to look for. I would say number one, just cost wise, is the roof. It's always the most, ex not always the most expensive, but it's something that gets constant wear and tear for a house. And if you do see a problem in your roof, if you do have any kind of leaking, that's where you start seeing mold problems and mildew issues, stuff like that. Um, you're going to want to look for the actual structural um, integrity of the building, like the foundation, um, any kind of, or what kind of support beams they have within the house. And by support beams and the found or the structure of the building, what I mean by that is if you get any kind of contractor, carpenter, um, house inspector in there, they'll be able to tell you the general layout. And sometimes people, uh, there's actually someone in here who has a funny story, but uh, there's actually, sometimes you'll see, or the inspector rather will tell you, hey, there should be a sheer wall. There should be a load bearing wall right here in the living room, and there isn't. So, you know, with this house, the previous owner or someone before him probably did some home renovations by themselves. They took out this wall, and now there's no support beam. We could see some structural issues and things starting to bend and break in different areas of the home. Beauty. So, last question here. We're going to wrap up the questions. It says, "What's all included in strata like gas, water?" So, usually with uh, with the strata here, that's going to be your anemones. It's going to be your garbage, and uh, usually going to going to include the water as well. But when you're outlining the contract, which Liam uh, Liam would be uh, thorough and diligent when he's looking at that contract, is it's going to tell you exactly what's included in strata. Everyone is different but uh, a lot of them do include the water with the, with the strata as well. So good question, Roger. Well, and it's gonna be dependent from strata to strata as well. Um, it'll tell, or they'll tell you when you're looking at a property what's included in the strata fees. Sometimes it's just electrical and um, you know, let's say gas. Sometimes it's everything included. Uh, it's just, it's gonna switch from strata to strata. Beautiful. Well, we want to thank everybody for hopping on to our webinar. We're going to be getting the, the gifts out to people. We'll be connecting as well. You guys have our phone numbers. We have, we'll be able to connect via email as well. I want to thank you. And uh, yeah, without further ado, we'll let you enjoy the rest of your lovely Thursday evening. Absolutely. Thanks again, guys. Thanks for coming out. Thanks, fellas. Thank you, Jared.